Timber Talks is brought to you by Wood Solutions. Stay up to date with the latest in timber, the building material that is strong, safe and sustainable. Here is your host, Adam Jones. New tools for productivity are potentially allowing us to enter an unprecedented period in construction. Parametric design tools allow for new architectural forms, robotics and 3D printing allows for new assembly, and prefabrication enables for better on-site productivity. Today we're speaking with Richard Maddock, an architect and computer systems engineer with Fosters and Partners. In this episode, we speak about the NASA 3D printed habitat challenge for building on Mars and what learnings can be taken for design back here on Earth, how new technologies such as robotics and machine learning will impact construction and how the day-to-day workflow for building professionals might shift. Now, I really enjoyed speaking to Richard. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. And without any further ado, here is Richard Maddock. Yes, yes. So this um, this was a project. Sorry, this was a um, an open competition uh, that NASA held starting quite a few years ago. Now it's still ongoing. Um, and in the first few phases, the very first phase was to um, design a sort of artistic rendering of how a habitat on Mars might look, a three D printed habitat on Mars. And we entered that competition and we came second, um, which was quite exciting. And then phase two was to explore the material possibilities. You know, sure, you can do a pretty picture, but when, uh, when push comes to shove, how are you actually going to 3D print a habitat on Mars? Considering Mars is so far away, you can't really bring materials with you. So you have to use the native materials there. And that was phase two, was looking at the material nature of things. And we teamed up with a few companies in the US to explore uh, basically 3D printing with basalt. And um, it was quite exciting because they developed a uh, fibre that we could sort of melt, uh, almost like a plastic, but because it had basalt in it and it didn't have any water, it was very conducive to uh, something that could be printable on Mars. Mm. And that phase, you know, there was a structural test. You had to print three different objects and one of them you know, was like a cone and a flat shape and then a beam and each one would get crushed and tested. And we won that phase. You know, what we printed ended up being the strongest out of I think maybe 10 or 12 different uh, teams that entered. Um, It was quite interesting because we worked with our in-house structural engineers to come up with an ideal sort of topology and shape to print. Um, But in the final result where we had carved out gaps, trying to be clever and thinking, oh, well, if we just take some material away from there, that might make things a bit quicker. Uh, That's obviously where it failed. And it would have been just much easier just to print a solid chunk of material much stronger. Um, The third phase was to print an arbitrary shape that a NASA engineer had dreamed up. It had sort of overhangs and cantilevers and awkward corners and things like that. Um, And this was, you know, the culmination of these three phases. And there was a live showdown at the Caterpillar headquarters, just a little bit south of Chicago. And there you sort of had to literally press a button and let the robot do its thing and just print for, I think the time limit was four or five hours. That's all you had to print this shape, this structural shape. And then a big uh, caterpillar excavator would come over and try and crush it. And, uh, you know, they did test to see who made the strongest object with their printing. So there's quite a lot of technical difficulties in this. And we teamed up with a firm in the US called Branch Technologies who uh, do spatial 3D printing with robots. Um, And with this unique material that we had developed and with Branch Technology printing it, we printed this shape that looks a little bit like a steering wheel. And we won that phase as well. So the thing that we printed was finally crushed and I think it took uh, from memory about 1.2 to 1.5 tonnes to actually crush it and it was about, it's kind of like a steering wheel maybe 1.5 metres in diameter just to give you a sort of a like a dome shaped thing and it was quite impressive that this object that was printed with you know sort of basalt fibre 
could still withstand, you know, one and a half tonnes of pressure before it finally gave way. And where it actually failed was in a delamination of the printing process. So the material didn't fail. It was the sort of bonding or gluing of different layers as it had been printed that actually finally yielded and caused the failure. Um, so, you know, that was a very interesting thing to be a part of. And um, that was on the printing side of things. On the early stages, we were thinking about the actual mechanism of you're on Mars, how do you print a habitat on Mars? You obviously can't send people there. You need to have the habitat first. And so we ran quite a few workshops and did a lot of in-house work exploring the software side of things and taking some inspiration from the natural world and how termites build termite mounds without having a lead termite with a set of blueprints. They just sort of know there's a swarm of termites that know what to do based on individual rules they follow. And so what we ended up uh, thinking about and exploring and then writing the software for was for a robotic swarm. Rather than one big robot that could be liable to fail, we wanted to have a swarm of many little robots and give them little tasks. So maybe 20 robots would be digging robots. They would scurry off on the Martian surface, dig up some regolith and bring it back. And then another set of 20 robots might be the kind of robots that would deposit it into a sort of uh, shape that you want to build. And then there'd be another set of robots that might sinter it. You know, with a laser sinter, they would melt that regolith to form the structure that we need. Obviously, on Mars, there are issues with uh, temperature variations and radiation. So we need to ensure that human inhabitants are shielded from all of these dangers because mars is obviously not as amenable to life as earth is hmm. that's so interesting in undertaking a moon shot or a mars shot in this case uh, pun intended uh, <laughs> you're obviously uh stretching really what design is and designing from a completely different paradigm with different laws of physics what kind of learnings can you take from this design competition and bring it back to your day-to-day designs that you're taking part of? Yes. um, Very interesting that you mentioned the different physics as well because one thing we realised and learned was the um, different catenary shapes. Um, They are different on Mars as compared to Earth. Um, Mm. And, you know, when when you're thinking of pressure vessels and things like that, you know, that played a big role in the design of the habitat itself. Um, And also what was interesting, was our being architects at an architecture firm, uh, we had to place great emphasis on the human side of things. You know, there there are many technological solutions that you can come up with, but at the end of the day, this is a habitat for people in a harsh environment. And so we tried to make sure that there was some semblance of humanity in what we were designing. Hmm. And as for bringing things back to earth, you know, there are some schools of thought that think, all right, you can't worry about planets and space out there. We need to fix stuff on earth. Whereas I tend to think of that as a false dichotomy. You know, there are lessons to be learnt in building in harsh environments on Mars. It can also be applied here on earth. And then also you can go one step further and think about, you know, prefabrication and prefab and 3D printing. And we're obviously in very early days of that sort of uh, paradigm still. But it's interesting to have these really sort of far out challenging things and you spend quite a lot of time thinking about that. And then when it's over, you have a bit of time to ruminate and, and reflect. You know, those thoughts and processes inevitably feed back into what we end up designing here on Earth today. Absolutely. And you already mentioned a little bit about looking at robotics and also 3D printing. Uh, Mm. How do these new technologies enable different sorts of construction, different shapes, different construction and design efficiencies, and perhaps vice versa? How does design evolve or co-evolve with uh, the robotics and the 3D printing and these construction techniques? Yeah. um, So in, in terms of robots and robotics in construction, it's still obviously very, very early days. There are things, you know, CNC machines and, uh, you know, five and six axis milling 
um, for the timber world, which is uh, something that's been around for quite a number of years now. We've used on quite a few projects. That is now, I think, uh, not quite mainstream, but becoming mainstream and generally widespread. Um, newer technologies such as you know 3D printing with robots on a building scale is still uh, very nascent and we're actually doing some uh, research work now with 3D printing in metal and this is also again very very early days but you know thinking about things like 3D printing structural nodes in steel um, 3D printing in clay, maybe in concrete. There, there have been some efforts in that that haven't quite uh, been fruitful yet. Um, but, you know, there's a whole world of possibilities out there that I think can only be more exciting as time goes on. It's, it's still early days and, you know, there are no sort of real buildings that we can point to and say, hey, yeah, that was genuinely 3D printed and it's a great building that will last 100 years. But I feel like that day will that day will come. Mm. So you got the the construction side, which we might touch on toward the end of the podcast. But moving to the very start of the design and construction process, what innovations are you really implementing, or you're seeing in the digital design space? Yeah, um, that's an interesting one with um, digital design. So personally, um, I came to design in an interesting and unusual way because. Most people I know started out in the architecture or engineering world and then discovered computation. Um, whereas I started out in the computation world and then discovered architecture. Mm. Um, so for me, I, I kind of, I, I find it difficult to separate the two. I, I see the computation side of things as just a sort of tool that I have to use when I'm designing things. And for the cutting edge of what we're doing, we're now looking at machine learning and things like that. Um, I think it's been a little bit uh, overhyped so far. Um, and, you know, some people sort of promise the world with what artificial intelligence and machine learning can do. But we've, we've seen some uh, projects and research projects that have proven uh, their usefulness. And so one, so we did this research last year and it's continuing this year. And there was a paper presented at the NeurIPS conference in December last year. And what we did was we wrote a neural net that learned how to model uh, the CFD for wind flow. So we do quite a lot of, um, you know, urban scale master plans. And, you know, when you have buildings and towers and whatnot, you need to know how the wind flows and where it goes and make sure that people aren't blown off their feet at ground level. Doing the CFD to figure those things out can sometimes take up to a week to run one simulation. So in that sort of paradigm, when you're designing and trying to make a change and thinking about where things can go or should go or could go, if you have a week's lag between what you do and seeing the effect of it, that obviously reduces what you can explore. Your design space is limited. But with this uh, tool that we wrote, this neural net learnt how to do CFD very roughly. It was maybe 90% accurate, but it meant that we could run those CFD tests using this neural net in almost real time. You would get feedback in about five or 10 seconds. And this is very valuable because then as designers, you can play more with massing and layout and the urban design and, you know, the built fabric. And you can have immediate feedback on how that affects things such as wind flow. Mm. And then what's really interesting is because you have then set up this software process that does that, you can then run it backwards. You can then say, all right, here's the wind flow pattern I want. For example, here's a park. I want that to be fairly calm and quiet. And here's a road. I you know, want that to be a bit more windy to clear some fumes maybe, whatever you want. But you can dictate, here's the wind flow that I want. Now you tell me what layout of buildings results in that wind flow pattern. And this is where machine learning can be a creative thing. And it's just you know a very narrow spectrum of creativity, a very narrow spectrum thing. It's just on wind flow CFD. 
but it speeds up the design process so you can explore more possibilities. And it also provides a creative outlet that you can run the process backwards and maybe come up with things that you wouldn't have thought of or expected otherwise. Mm. So that's on machine learning CFD, which we're using machine learning to really unleash the creativity of the designers and maybe get more optimal outcomes. If you look at other industries like the automotive industry, they're using uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence for, for driverless vehicles and things like that. Mm. I guess the, the people who are maybe potentially getting ahead of themselves who you were referring to before might be the ones who you know, think eventually structural design, maybe costing, maybe all aspects of the design might be embedded within software that uses machine learning. Do you think in the future that this will reach this point? And if so, how will the designers in those different professions need to adapt to unleash their creativity like you were mentioning? Yeah. Um, if that point were to happen, it's a long way away. It's genuinely decades away. Um, I don't think anyone is in danger of losing their job to a machine that will you know, spit out amazing designs in, in terms of architecture or engineering. However, where I really see this having a use and being employed widely is in sort of doing trivial tasks or mundane things, more monotonous things. As an example, uh, a good friend of mine was the head of research at WeWork and they worked on uh, machine learning software that uh, laid out desks in an office space. So obviously what they do is quite quite narrow. You know, they rent buildings and then try and put as many desks as they can in each space, in each room. And for an architect to figure out, oh, can I fit in six or seven or eight or 12 desks is a fairly uh, laborious thing and not particularly exciting or pleasant. So that's somewhere where software, machine learning, can step in and sort of take over that task from a person. And that frees them up to do other much more interesting things. And I think that sort of future for engineers and architects and uh, cost consultants and people like that, software will begin to take over those sorts of things that you find fairly dull and tedious in your day-to-day job that you have to do, but you don't necessarily love doing it. And that's where I think we'll see the real gains. And that's where it'll be interesting that that sort of task that might take you a day to do will just be done in in a few seconds and reliably. And then you can move on to doing other things and thinking about other things. Mm. And I think that sort of process will begin to seep in over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, there will still be room for designers and creative people to think creatively. Mm. Love it. It's an exciting future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so that's the design part of the equation. One of the other things I'm interested to hear your thoughts on is the construction aspects. And do you see the future continuing and predominantly being in off-site construction? And if this is the case, what are are some of the reasons and the drivers in in this direction? Yeah, look, I I think so. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, there have been many projects that I've worked on that have employed off-site construction and they have obviously benefited from that immensely. The Maggie Centre in Manchester uh, was a timber structure, um, LVL, and that was milled in Switzerland and then brought to site and the whole thing was assembled in about two or three weeks. And, you know, seeing that happen you know, you, you really get a sense for how powerful off-site construction can be and certainly a material like timber, engineered timber, uh, is very amenable for off-site construction. Having said that, I think there'll still be a you know, portion of construction that is done on-site. That is inevitable. As for whether the future will be predominantly off-site, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I think we will see that play out over the next few years. Mm. When it comes to off-site construction, is it's basically a, a, I think there's a dichotomy in how it's currently being built and what the opportunities are. And on one side, you've got highly tailored architectural solutions where you've got the digital design using parametric modelling speaking to a you know, the CNC machine. But then also the other side of the equation is because uh, you're using a factory, you can actually pump out the designs of a building 
analogous to how you design a car and the repetitive nature means you can drive up efficiencies. So what are your comments on, I guess, where it's going in, in that regard? Yeah, I, look, I, I certainly hope that um, digital design, computational design will allow us uh, to have highly tailored architectural solutions at an affordable price. Um, so I, I grew up on a farm in Tasmania. When I go back to visit my parents, uh, there's the farm over the highway got sold recently and there's now a big subdivision in there. And mm. there's maybe, I don't know, three or 400 houses. And, you know, my dad and I drove around and they're fairly, um, I would almost say depressing because not because of their design or anything like that, you know, that's fine, but more the, more the fact that they pay no heed or attention to where the sun is or to where the prevailing winds are coming from or the topography or the environmental conditions. They're just, you know, plans that were drawn up in an office and then someone built them and it didn't matter which way the house was even facing, whether it faced north or south or, you know, no thought was given to that. So my hope is that digital design, this parametric design, we can, you know, go from file to factory and still have these bespoke buildings that respond to the local context, respond to the conditions, have some sort of notion of where the sun is, you know, where, where the land falls down and where you want your building to be placed on it. So my hope is that we can have those bespoke solutions that are cost effective and provide a wonderful place for people to live and live their lives and work and play using robots and computation and uh, prefab offsite construction to make all that happen. Mm. So we've had a quite a forward thinking discussion on the enablers of new design and construction. What do you see as the impacts of this mixing with sustainability? Will this enable us to improve our designs from a sustainability point of view, do you think? Well, hopefully, um, you know, and certainly for a material like timber that has so many wonderful sustainable qualities, certainly within the office I work at uh, Foster and Partners, there's been a growing emphasis on using timber more. Um, there's been a growing emphasis on looking at the carbon that is embedded within our buildings and a growing emphasis on you know, life cycle carbon. Um, some new projects that I've been working on recently we've been trying to ascertain, all right, not just how much carbon is in the building we're designing and constructing, but how we design it, what does that mean for the carbon use for the life cycle of the building for the 30, 40, 50, 60 years this building is going to be in use? Do we go for a double skin or a single skin facade? If we use timber, what does that mean for the life cycle carbon? And, you know, these sorts of questions are very interesting and they're the kind of questions that can only really be answered properly by using computational design. And, you know, that sort of future is, you know, once again, it's very nascent and very new, but that, that I think is quite exciting. And, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on sustainability. And for us as architects, we're in the service industry, but I'm seeing more and more that that is happening. The clients are interested in sustainability and the story of sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that you're excited about going forward in, in construction in terms of uh, technologies that you might want to leave us with as we approach the end of the podcast? Yeah, um, I'm certainly interested in uh, post-occupancy evaluation you know that's something that we try to do and you know it does prove difficult because once again you know you, you need clients on board to want that to happen i've always found the idea of designing a building and then it just sort of you know you built it and you have the opening ceremony and everyone moves in and, and it's all nice and great and they use it but then you don't have any visibility on how it actually performs hmm. and you know that's something that i think would be not only interesting but very valuable as a learning tool to then fold back into the design of what comes next, you know, to know that, oh, we tried this and it didn't work or, oh, we tried this and it worked really well or, oh, we didn't realise that this um, combination of two things that we tried then resulted in blah, blah, blah happening. Mm -hmm. So that sort of um, POE I think is quite interesting and that's starting, you know, I'm starting to see that happen on projects that have finished in the last year or two 
And the other one is uh, building maintenance and operation. If we can have these sort of smart buildings and smart sensors that help us run and operate buildings better, then that will um, provide more efficiencies in terms of energy use and things like that. Hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's something that I think is quite interesting moving forward too. And uh, as, as we wrap it up now, what do you see as the future of timber and some of the solutions that it can provide for our current challenges? Yeah, I mean, timber, so, you know, I grew up in Tasmania when I was a young lad, I would uh, make furniture out of the local special species in Tassie. So I've always had a great love for timber. And when I first started in architecture, there wasn't much timber going around. And certainly in the, in the last, you know, five or 10 years, it's been a um, huge emphasis on engineered timber. And I think that sort of material is very interesting for, I, I think the 21st century will be an engineered timber century. And, you know, once again, we're early days and there have been, you know, quite a few projects, but where it will go from here, I think is quite exciting. Um, you know, when I think of glue lamb and CLT and what I'm personally interested in is trying to join timber without steel, you know, using sort of traditional Japanese timber joints um, to make those connections. You know, that, that, that I see as being an interesting path forward. And, you know, that then leads to possibilities of assembly and disassembly and rearrangement and things like that. Mm. So, yeah, no, timber has a very exciting future. Thanks so much, Richard. If people want to find out more about you and Fosters and Partners, where can they go? Uh, well, you can Google Foster and Partners. You can probably Google my name. I haven't uh, Googled it recently, so I don't know what comes up. But I'm, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, or you can email me at rmaddock, that's M-A-D-D-O-C-K, at fosterandpartners.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Richard Maddock. I definitely learned a lot and I'm looking forward to learn a lot more because he's going to be presenting a webinar to the Wood Solutions database. I'll leave a link in the show notes for you to sign up and also to sign up some of the other webinars that are going to be held in the 2020 Wood Solutions webinar series.